We're going to start on topic three today, which is a discussion about the practical side of chemistry. So really what we want to do when we study chemistry at the end of it is to be able to make things make new materials and run reactions so that we produce those products. The topic that we're going to talk about in topic three is stoichiometry, which is basically the concept of relating different quantities that are involved when we're running a chemical reaction. That quantity could be mass, which is a very common one. Well, you'll see later could be volumes, could be pressure, but it's the different quantities that we use to measure how much matter we have. So you can answer questions like how much product can I get if I'm running a reaction? Uh, how much reactant do I need to complete my reaction if I want a certain amount of product? Um, do I get all the product that I expect to get or do I actually get less? And if I get less, how much less do I get? Can I improve it the next time around? So all of these are very uh, practical questions that you would ask anytime you're trying to make something and stoichiometry will help you answer those questions. In order for us to be able to use stoichiometry, the first thing we need to understand is how to quantify the masses of of elements because this becomes a central conversion factor that we're going to be using as we convert from quantities that we can see to quantities that we cannot see. Atomic mass of an element is measured just like any quantity relative to some type of a standard. Measuring weights of objects we say that we measure them relative to some standard which we call a unit like pounds or grams, kilograms. Those are all the different standards we use. Now we're talking about measuring an atom. So an atom is really tiny so we have to use a small amount of mass as our standard. The standard we use is the carbon-12 isotope. So that's just pure carbon-12. Uh, carbon has six protons in it so carbon-12 isotope would have six protons and six neutrons. Now we define the mass of carbon-12 because we're using it as a unit as exactly 12 atomic mass units. The mass of the other atoms are then defined with respect to that number, the 12 atomic mass unit or AMU. Don't forget that AMU, which we discussed in a prior video, is actually corresponding roughly to the mass of a proton. Remember that the mass of the carbon atom is really 12 times the mass of the proton. The mass of the proton is roughly this number right here. AMU is, is a unit that we use to help us you know, make things a little easier instead of having to remember this actual mass of a proton. The way we figure out the masses of elements is by running it through an instrument that's called a mass spectrometer, which is shown right here. Now, when you have a sample of an element, the sample doesn't just come with one pure isotope. We talked about this in a prior video that neon has three different isotopes. It has the isotopes of neon 20, neon 21, neon 22. So when you run a sample of neon through a mass spectrometer, it's going to show you three different results, just like this. It's showing you the mass on the x-axis and on the y-axis is showing you that abundance of that specific isotope. So the peaks here and the area under peak really corresponds to the percent abundance of that specific isotope. Isotope. So for neon, in this case, we can see that isotope 20 has the most a number of particles, right? So it's the most abundant one, followed by isotope 22, followed by isotope 21. Another way the plot can be shown is looking like this with lines instead of actual peaks like this. But the information that's given is the same. Now let's talk a little bit about how that mass spectrometer works. So if you have a sample, let's say again of neon or some other element, if it's not a gas, so you're going to heat it. Once it's a gas, what you're going to do, is going to go through a chamber where that sample is going to get hit by an electron beam and what that makes it is that it causes the particles in the sample to be ionized and at that point once it gets through here what's traveling through here is the cations or the positive charge species of whatever sample you have okay so if it's neon then it's going to be a bunch of neon with either plus one plus two plus three and so on the reason we need to charge it is because the way this is getting moved forward through the mass spectrometer the way the sample gets moved forward is that it's getting pulled by an electric field. In order for the electric field to pull the sample forward, the samples have to be charged. They're, they get accelerated 
by the pulling of those electric fields. And then at some point during their path, they're going to encounter this large magnet because magnets and electricity are two related concepts. Interaction with the magnet causes those ions to turn in a specific direction, depending on how the magnet is angled. So eventually those ions will reach a target and it will hit that target and we're going to record it and that will tell us what the mass is. Now, how do we learn the mass? Well, different isotopes have different masses. The angle at which they are bent by the magnet really corresponds to two things. It corresponds to the charge that they have and it corresponds to the mass of the ions. Now, if you happen to select ions with the same charge, let's say you select all the plus one cations, then at that point, the degree of bending will just depend on the mass of those cations. So you can imagine that something that's lighter maybe will bend to a larger degree compared to something that's heavier and will bend to a smaller degree. And so as a result, you can see that the one that bends the least is the isotope 22 for neon. And then the one that bends the most is isotope 20 for neon. And that's really how we get information about isotope masses. The way the percent abundance can be recorded is the more hits you get at that spot, then the more abundant that specific isotope is. So how do we get the mass of the isotope once we get the data from the mass spec? Well, the way we do it is we measure the mass relative to that carbon 12 isotope, which has a mass of exactly 12 AMU. So what we do is we would say, well, how much heavier or lighter is an isotope compared to carbon 12? Like an example here is the silicon 28 isotope. We find that the mass of that isotope of silicone is 2.331411 with 12. And you get this number right here in units of AMU. And that is the mass of the silicone 28 isotope. Now we just say 28 here and basically what we're doing there is rounding that number just because it's a lot easier to write that number than to write 27.97693 and of course that's the actual mass. This is a count of the protons and the neutrons that make up that particular mass. This mass is what we call the isotopic mass because it's the mass of each isotope that we have. The abundance as I said earlier is measured also in in the mass spec. And in this particular case, it will be 92.23%. For silicone, for example, when we do this experiment, we would see three different isotopes. And these are the actual masses of the isotope. So it's the isotopic masses and the percent abundance of each of the isotopes. Now using this data, we can calculate the average atomic mass of silicone. The way we do that is simply just by multiplying each of the isotopic mass with the percent abundance and add adding all those three numbers. So the way I get this number right here, 28.0855, which is the average atomic mass, is to take 27.97693 times 92.23% plus 28.976495 times 4.67% and then plus the last one. And if you do all that, you're going to get that number. This is the number that you will see on the periodic table. So in the periodic table, you see two numbers. One is the atomic number, which is the number of protons. And the second one is the atomic mass. But the atomic mass that's given is the average atomic mass. And that's the number that we get by calculating all the different isotopes. Okay, so let's work through an example of calculating the average atomic mass using the equation that we just talked about. So the question here says boron has two naturally occurring isotopes and the two isotopes are boron 10 and boron 11. And what they want us to find here is the percent abundance of each of the isotopes, given that we know the atomic mass of boron being 10.81. So that's the actual average atomic mass, right? And then the isotopic mass of boron 10 is this value right here in units of AMU. And then for boron 11, 11, it's that value. So the starting point here is the equation for average atomic mass, which is written right here. So this is the symbol for the sum of each of the isotopic mass times its percent abundance. Now, obviously, in this problem, we don't know what the percent abundance is of each of the isotopes. But one thing we know is that if we add all the percent abundance, we should get 100% for all the isotopes. Now, since we only have two isotopes, then the percent abundance of boron 10 plus the percent abundance of boron 11 should equal 100%. Or we can also write that as just one. Now, because we don't know either one of them, this is the time when you want to be using algebra and variables to help you solve the problem. So we can say that let x be the percent abundance 
of one of the isotopes. Could be 10, could be 11. In this case, I'm using 10 for X. And that means that 100% minus X would be the percent abundance of boron 11. Instead of writing 100% minus X, I just write one minus X, okay? So keeping in mind that I've changed the percentage into a decimal form. So one of the things that people often do here is sometimes they would just write X is percent abundance of boron 10 and Y is the percent abundance of boron 11. The issue with that, of course, is that you have two variables and you only have one equation. And so you can't really solve an equation equation if you have more variables than the number of equations you have. So this is where you want to think a little bit about when you set up your variables. So once you have those x and my 1 minus x representation, then you can just plug that back into the average atomic mass equation. So 10.81 AMU, which is the average atomic mass, should equal 10.0129 times x. So 10.0129 AMU is the boron 10 mass, and x is the percent of abundance for boron 10. And then plus 11.0093 AMU, which is the isotopic mass of boron 11, times its percent abundance, which is 1 minus x. Then this now becomes a math equation where we can open up our parentheses here for the 1 minus x and multiply that out the 11, and we get this equation right here. Once we have that, we can rearrange the equation to isolate the variable on one side. So that gives us 0.99 964x. And on the other side, we have the number, which is 0.1993. Solving for x, we would get 0 0.20002, or multiplying that by 100% will give us 20%, basically 20.00%. Now that's based on the significant figures we have for the masses that is given right here, which is four sig figs. So that is our percent abundance for boron 10. Boron 11 would just be 100% minus 20%, which is 80%.